Hi, welcome to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. I'm Dr. Doug Lantry from the museum's research division, and we're standing here beneath the massive and legendary XB-70 Valkyrie. The purpose of the XB-70 program was to enhance nuclear deterrence. It was meant to be a high-speed, high-altitude nuclear bomb delivering aircraft. And that was its role in the early part of the Cold War. It was an early part of the so-called triad, bombers, submarines, land-based ballistic missiles. Let's talk about the canards on the XB-70. They're a really unique design feature, and this airplane has unique geometry. The canards uh, contribute to that geometry by solving a really important problem. They're a trim device that solves stability problems between the low speed of about 150 knots and the high speed of about Mach 3 and every speed in between. You'll see that the back half of the canard is a flap. Having a canard on the fore part of the airplane solves the problem of putting flaps on an extreme delta wing design. So what about the windshield on this airplane? Well, it's got unique features as well. For supersonic flight, a completely flat profile is necessary. So the outer windscreen on the XB-70 is a kind of ramp that, uh, that uh, transitions up and down. At slow speeds, it can transition down into the nose to give the pilots a forward view. But at high speed, that outer windscreen comes back up and covers the inner windscreen. So the crew compartment is completely isolated from that and the outer windscreen is only for aerodynamic purposes. Let's talk about wheels. This is the front gear of the XB-70. These tires are made by BF Goodrich and you'll notice that they're silver. Not many tires are silver. BF Goodrich developed a special heat resisting compound that's infused throughout the body of the tire and also painted on its surface to make these tires withstand temperatures up to 360 degrees Fahrenheit. It's made possible by that silver uh, painted compound on them, which is also infused throughout the body of the tire. The tires, in turn, are cooled up in the wheel well by a mixture of ethylene glycol circulating through brazed tubes inside the wheel well. So they're cooled by the surface of the tire and they're cooled inside the aircraft. So here's the rear bogies of the XB-70 where the main tires are. The tires are the same as on the front, but uh, check out this little tire here. This little one is about anti-skidding. That tire doesn't have any temperature protection because it doesn't need it. What it does is it tells the computers inside the airplane when to apply the brakes and how much. The brakes, by the way, on this airplane withstand up to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. There was an incident once uh, landing one of these airplanes where these bogies didn't work like they were supposed to. The whole thing pivots front to back so that the back tires hit first and then the front tires. Well, one time, one of the bogies didn't pivot right and so the back half of one of the bogies was uh, severely damaged. Didn't lose the aircraft though. Compression lift is a key feature of XB-70 aerodynamics. The area of the shockwave formation on this airplane, which is just at the front of the intake splitter duct on the underside of the fuselage and wings, uh, creates a shockwave that increases lift in this airplane by as much as 30%. It also uh, creates a reduced drag condition and enables the airplane to cruise quickly at Mach numbers at a lower angle of attack. Saves fuel, increases speed, decreases drag. So compression lift is a key component of the aerodynamics of this airplane. Another key part of XB-70 aerodynamics is variable geometry wingtips, these things over here. 
at low speeds, landing, taking off, and so on, the wings are perfectly flat, perfectly flat, no anhedral, no dihedral. But at low altitude, low supersonic speeds, those wingtips can fold down at 25 degrees. That increases the stability of the airplane, makes it easier to control. At high speed, high altitude, those wingtips fold down to 65 degrees. Not only does that solve uh, stability problems, but miraculously, it also increases lift. So the variable geometry of this airplane both increases lift, provides stability, and allows an airplane like this to operate in a wide range of speeds between 150 knots and about Mach 3. It's really an amazing design feature. Another thing about the fold-down wingtips is that at high supersonic speeds, because they provide extra stability, they allow the relative size of the twin upper fins, the vertical fins, to be that much smaller, thereby reducing drag. This is all very clever design solutions to high-speed supersonic flight in the 1960s. Riding your own shockwave is a feature of this airplane. That compression lift uh, holds the airplane up, of course, or uh, provides like 30% greater lift than it otherwise would if the shockwave didn't exist. And also the fold-down wingtips increase that lift in addition to providing stability. They allow the vertical fins on the top of the airplane to be that much smaller proportionally, which in turn reduces drag. So it's all part of a very clever design solution that all works together through some variable geometry to make this airplane a unique aerodynamic specimen. One of the most amazing features of the XB70 that you can see here in the museum is the business end of the raw power of this jet. At the back of the aircraft, you can stand here and marvel at the six, six side-by-side -side General Electric YJ93 afterburning turbojets. Now, the aircraft could achieve Mach 3 even if one of the engines wasn't working with only about a 7% loss in range. But the bottom line for these engines is that they operate best at very high speeds. They operate uh, in continuous afterburner, and so they're most efficient at super high speeds. And joining six of them together in a row like this is nothing but high speed power. Each one of these engines develops a maximum of about 30,000 pounds thrust. Each of those engines actually was developed as, well, a single engine for another single engine fighter project, which was canceled. But putting six of them together, same engine, gives this airplane its tremendous speed. You can see modern examples of something like this. For example, today's B-1B has four of the same approximate types of engines that the single engine F-16 fighter has. So think of a B-1 in terms of power as about four F-16s. Same with this thing, it's got six fighters worth of power. This is the guts of the XB-70's power. This is General Electric's YJ-93 afterburning turbojet. This engine weighs a little more than two tons and develops a maximum of about 30,000 pounds thrust. It's got an 11-stage air-cooled compressor and a two-stage turbine. One of the unique things about this engine, unique for the time anyway, is that the afterburner, though it looks like any afterburner, is not controlled through cable linkages. This afterburner is controlled electronically because you've got six of them to control. That's a big task for any pilot. And so think of six of these two-ton engines together, each developing 30,000 pounds of thrust, and you get a really, really fast, big airplane like the XB-70. An interesting part of the trailing edge of the XB-70's wings is the series of elevons combination ailerons and elevator along uh, the trailing edge of both wings. These are for latitudinal and longitudinal stability, 
and it was designed with these trailing edge elevons to be split into six segments on either side of the engine bay and they're operated by no fewer than 24 separate hydraulic jacks. By the way, the uh, elevons are operated only hydraulically. There's no manual reversion for the pilot if the hydraulics fail. But again, they operate as elevator and aileron both. Flaring to land, you're looking at the sky. So, no wonder these guys were the hottest pilots around. And you try and fly this crazy shape that, you know, it's elegant, it's sleek, it's great, but it's got to be really difficult to steer. In addition to the airplane being tricky and exotic to fly, think about maneuvering the XB-70 on the ground. Think about where the pilot is and where the front gear is. The pilot is something like 60 feet in front of the gear. So trying to turn the XB-70 is like, I don't know, trying to turn a diving board that you're sitting on the end of. It's got to be very tricky because the wheel's back there and you are out here in front turning. So you're just swinging across this arc. The wheel's way behind you. That had to be hard to do. It was a complex airplane. Like other airplanes of its era, it was full of analog dials and gauges. And so every pilot knows that there's a, a kind of a habit, a system of scanning the instruments to make sure that everything's okay. Well, think of that job inside the XB-70. Six engines. A flight regime anywhere from 150 knots to Mach 3 with high-speed crews at Mach 2 or Mach 3 preferable for the airframe and the engines. Plus, you've got a control system that is dependent on these forward canards, elevons in the back, folding wingtips, and so on. So this is not your average airplane to fly. Um, it was perhaps a little tricky and unusual, However, the seven people who flew that aircraft were well acquainted with unusual flying situations in unusual vehicles. So it wasn't a big surprise for them, but it would probably overwhelm the rest of us. The crew accommodations in the XB-70 might not be what you'd expect. You might think, wow, in such a fast, high-altitude airplane, they're going to be wearing spacesuits. Well, not so. The XB-70's crew cabin was air-conditioned in a shirt-sleeves environment. The temperature in there at, at any speed was something between 70 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was a shirt-sleeves environment. However, if they experienced uh, decompression at high altitude, each of the crew members, the pilot and co-pilot, they each had a separate kind of clamshell enclosure, very similar to the one in the B-58 that would automatically close and then from inside of that pressurized enclosure the pilots could monitor the instruments through windows in this little clamshell and they could bring the aircraft back down to a safe altitude. They had controls inside the little clamshell. Once they were at a safe altitude they could open the clamshell back again. Now, if they had to eject from the airplane, the whole clamshell, both of them would come out of the airplane, out of the top, like an ejection seat. One of the most interesting technological facets of the XB-70 program was its steel honeycomb structure. Advances in the art of steel making realized in the XB-70 program were especially notable. It was principally a steel airplane. It represented the first widespread use of stainless steel in a honeycomb panel structure. The panels of the airplane, which are comprised of uh, facing sheets of steel brazed onto a honeycomb-like core, make up 22,000 square feet of the surface of the airplane. This kind of honeycomb-style stainless steel was carried out by the Armco Steel Corporation of Middletown, Ohio. And we've got a honeycomb panel on display that you can see uh, that was made by Aronka Incorporated. But these 
honeycomb steel panels are an important part of XB70 technology and an important legacy to the art of steel making and aerodynamic structures. 69% of the airplane's 150,000 pound weight is this welded stainless steel honeycomb sandwich. Uh, it covers the wings from tip to tip. It covers the engine box and the center fuselage and the fins and the rudders and the forward part of the canards. Most of the forward fuselage and aft plane is built up from titanium alloys. So here's an airplane that's mostly stainless steel, but also titanium. These things also make it very, very unusual in the 1960s and make it exotic even today. The second XB-70 uh, was a tragic loss. In the summer of 1966, it was flying a, a photo mission. It was being photographed uh, with uh, two chase aircraft. One of them was an F-104. But the F-104 collided with the XB-70 in midair, and its pilot was killed immediately. And the XB-70, its wing was damaged and both vertical stabilizers were gone. And it flew on for only a couple of seconds before it became uncontrollable. And uh, its co-pilot, uh, Major Carl Cross, died, unfortunately. And the North American uh, pilot, uh, Al White, ejected from the XB-70, but uh, he was badly injured. But that's how the airplane was lost. That's why there's only one XB-70 now. The base support for the XB-70 was all at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Big Air Force testing center. They had all the facilities, super long runways, all the rest of it. And the only time that an XB-70 ever landed anywhere else was when our XB-70 landed here at Wright Field. The museum got its XB-70, which was the first one made and the only one that exists now, in 1969. The talents required to design the XB-70 included both talent and persistence. The airplane was designed Without the kind of supercomputer modeling that we're used to having today, where we know exactly how aerodynamic flow works because we can simulate it inside of a computer at millions and millions of operations per second. Well, in the 1950s, airplanes were designed with a decent knowledge of how aerodynamic flow works, but testing the real article was the proof of how it was actually going to work. So all of the, the crazy geometry of the XB-70, the forward canards, the elevons, the slightly smaller than you'd expect vertical surfaces, the hugely swept wings, the, uh, the wingtips that, that uh, fold downward in high speed flight, all of that variable geometry is the result of people thinking through high speed aerodynamic problems and then also thinking through the requirement for the airplane to take off and land at a relatively low speed. So you've got the windscreen, the canopy that pivots so that at high speed it's a flat surface, but at low speed the pilots can still see out. You've got the canards acting as flaps. You've got the splitters in front of the engine creating a place where uh, compression lift comes into play, massively increasing the lift of the airplane. You've got all the fuel management for six very powerful engines that operated on afterburners all the time. You've got the wings that pivot at the tips depending on the speed. And by the way, you've got tires. Every airplane needs tires. Well, special tires on the XB-70 were especially made to withstand heat. The bogies in the back had a little extra wheel as a skid uh, sensor so that the brakes could be applied correctly because a big heavy airplane landing fast needs to have the brakes applied correctly. And so all of these things, all of these factors, the engineering smarts required to create this airplane, they all had to exist in the 1950s. And those guys coming up with an airplane that looks sleek and futuristic even today is remarkable. One thing that, that we emphasize um, 
among Air Force historians and museum curators and archivists is the differences and similarities between history and heritage. They're two different things, but they join hands and they join a couple of different professions together in presenting a picture of our past and making it relevant and interesting in the present. So the history part is what happened. What actually did happen? And can you prove it? And what are your sources? The heritage part, on the other hand, is what do we believe is valuable enough about our past to pass on to the future? It's our habits, our stories, um, our mythology in some cases, what we're proud of, the things we choose to tell people that we did. And so with something like the XB70, we know about its technological history. We know what it's made of, who made it, and what they did with it. Its heritage is a story about technological progress and breaking barriers and crossing boundaries and making tools for the Air Force to use to protect the country that crossed technological boundaries and brought us the future that we live in now. One of the most amazing factoids about the XB-70 is that even though the airplane looks like the latest, sleekest, modern airplane, it's two years older than the original Star Trek. The airplane first flew in 1964, and Captain Kirk was not in orbit until 1966. One of the notable personalities connected with the XB-70 is Lieutenant Colonel Fitz Fulton. He made 63 flights in an XB-70 and had the most flight time of 124 hours in XB-70A, the one that we have here. He worked for both the Air Force and for NASA, and he is an enshrinee of the National Aviation Hall of Fame. One of the reasons I think that the XB-70 is such a popular airplane with museum visitors and with visitors online is not just because of its technical features, but because it is a flat-out beautiful airplane. It's attractive and balanced in every way. There's nothing ugly about that airplane. It just says speed, elegance, and high technology. It's always been like that. You can see the XB-70 and hundreds of other interesting, exotic, and historic aircraft here at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. And if you can't get here immediately, you can go on our website and see all the same stuff. And you can even get inside the cockpits with our Cockpit 360 application, where you can look around the inside of these airplanes, including the XB-70. So I encourage you to visit and to visit our website.